Okay, let's try this again. Can you see my web browser? No. Well, I see a screen that is all white. That says the working group's web browser, but but there's nothing useful being rendered. Okay, WebEx. What about that? Are you just trying to see if it's showing? I'm trying to share. Yeah, well, I, we can see we can see your note well window and the other window oh. and TextMate. Oh. oh, wait. Can you see my entire screen or just the individual no. window? I just see the two. I see Safari and I see TextMate. Okay. I suppose I could dial into the meeting from another computer and see. What yeah. That's I see that in the past. I'm connected from the browser because the app isn't working and I can see nothing. Hello? Can you hear me? Yep, we can. If you can't see the materials on uh, the sharing, which I, I stopped, so I'll start that again real quick. Uh, they are available in the repo and on. But now I'm sharing my browser, so you should see the note well. Uh, let me leave and read. Oh, no, I can see it. Yes. Oh, now. Hello. And I see only Martin and me in the Jabber. Are people not using Jabber? I'm there. Oh, no. Sorry, I'm not actually in the room. Ah, there's Mark. All right. So let's get started. Um, start with what's on the screen, which is the note well. If you're not familiar with this, this is the policies under which we all participate in the ITF, even virtually. And so if you're not familiar with this, please do take the time to get uh, familiar with it. It's about things like intellectual property, harassment procedure, code of conduct, copyrights, and so forth and so on. Um, and you can find it at the URL at the top of the page or by searching, searching for IETF note well. Excuse me. Uh, with that done, I will stop sharing this. Why did my camera just turn on? Okay. Let's 
It's extremely odd that it just turned my camera on. I trust WebEx even less. Uh, let me share the agenda. So uh, today, uh, in this week's meeting, we're going to have a fairly substantial discussion of prioritization uh, led by Lucas. And then we're going to have about 10 minutes for the client cert header proposal from Brian. And finally, about 15 minutes for the use of fund resource error HD status code by Cole. Uh, do we have any agenda bashing? Can people hear me? Yes, I can. So, uh, if there's no agenda bashing, uh, we'll go on. Uh, the blue sheets are at the link that I just pasted into the chat on uh, WebEx. We can also paste it in the Jabber room for the folks who are there. Uh, if you could just go and put your name in there on one line and then close the Etherpad so that other people can get in. We've had some capacity issues. Uh, likewise, do we have any volunteers for taking the names? People joining and leaving. Any volunteers? We did get one volunteer on the mailing list, I believe. I don't, I don't see them in the list of participants. Yep. Martin volunteered in the WebEx chat. Fantastic. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Martin, there's a Google Doc link from the agenda. Is that good for you? Really? You're going to make me use that? Okay. I don't think you use that. It was just a suggestion. I was just going to throw it in the Etherpad, but that's fine too. The only thing about the Etherpad is that we might, well, what do we have? 30 people? As long as everyone doesn't pound the Etherpad, we should be okay. So if, if you're the main one. If you want to help Martin out, please do uh, go in and help him keep the minutes complete. But if you're just watching, maybe if, if things get slow. And then as uh, just for the management of lines for asking questions and stuff, I'll be watching the chat in WebEx. If you do the plus Q thing, then I'll make sure to um, Get you in the right order. All right, let me get Lucas's slides together. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. That time it decided to turn my camera on. Fantastic. Can people see the extensible priority slides? Yes, but it looks like it's uh, it, it's small. It's not the whole window. So if you could extend it to the whole window, that'd be great. Okay, I, I can't see them, but let me leave and rejoin, which seems to fix the problem. So I'll be back in in a few seconds. I'm going to have some feedback about our choice of tools.
Yeah, all good now. All good? Okay. So take it away, Lucas, and tell me when to advance the slide. Yeah, sure. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is, is possibly my first HTTP interim meeting, so it's really exciting. Um, so I'm going to talk about the extensible priorities draft, which was adopted um, following a call for adoption that we, or Tommy, put out um, just after Singapore. Um, so this document has been active in, in, the, in the working group for about six months now. Um, we brought that in with some known issues that we've been trying to talk through. So um, if you go on to the next slide, please. I just want to give a brief refresher for everyone. This isn't going to go into the technical details of, of you know, how it all works. That's not a, a valuable use of time. I'd rather focus on some of the issues, but just to give it some context, uh, the, the extensible priority scheme is uh, different to the old H2 priorities. Um, and rather than dependencies and weights, we have two parameters that we define in the document. Uh, the first is an urgency level, which is a structured header integer um, in the range zero to seven, which I'll, I'll illustrate in a couple of slides for more detail. Um, and a priority flag, uh, sorry, the, an incremental flag, which is a Boolean, um, which describes how a user agent can use the resource. And that can be used, say, by a server to um, uh, to uh, decide how to schedule things. So some examples of how you would serialize this to a what to the wire is to take those structured headers parameters, convert them into a structured header itself um, called the priority header um, and send them such as this u equals one, u equals three plus i. So it's if ultimately this is a, a dictionary of parameters. And the idea is that in future, people could define some extension parameters um, we have some use cases already, but the core document, Extensible Priorities, is focused on these two things, which, based on the design team's work in the past, feel that gives us enough fidelity to provide, uh, you know, web browsing, uh, sorry, prioritization of resources and responses that can suit a web browsing use case and some others, maybe, if people want to, but predominantly built around that. Um, so if you could go on to the next slide, please. The, the rough shape of that draft has been around for a while. Um, and so people have been thinking about how they might want to use that before the adoption. Um, but what I can say based on, on my, my understanding, um, which may be slightly wrong or out of date, um, I did try to do a, a very loose survey of things. But people who have been interested and have actually started some work to implement the extensible priority schema at Chrome um, and quickly and slash H2O, uh, NGTCP2 or NGHB3. Um, the implementation I'm responsible for, Quiche, has got a work in progress um, for this. Uh, I believe MoveFast similarly has some work in progress code and, and some others uh, too. Um, so this is this is good. Um, I've got some commentary on, on how we might want to look at interop. Um, but it's it's good that people are at least thinking of, or sorry, have done the implementation following the strong support that we had in the core adoption. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I just want to give a flavour of the impact of this scheme um, for for the quiche implementation that I mentioned we're responsible for. Um, obviously, a lot of this comes down to how a server would schedule resources anyway regardless of what the priority signal is, which is what extensible priorities focuses on. It also gives some guidance on how to, to take those signals and what to do with them. It's very little because ultimately the priority signal is a hint. Um, but what I wanted to illustrate here is that by thinking through how to incorporate this scheme and to rewrite our scheduler, that we would say without any, any work, what we can do today is for five concurrent transfers of five megabytes, all with the, the same equivalent urgency. A server that doesn't understand that just ignores them and sends all of those resources in a round robin fashion. Um, and so what, I'm, what this graph shows is it's a, a QViz illustration from a queue log captured by a quiche client showing what a server is doing. And, and this bottom bar, uh, sorry, it, around the middle of the screen, it's like a smeared color which shows effectively aliasing because 
We're sending lots of streamed frames in tight round robin fashion. By implementing the, the extensible priority scheme in Quiche, what we were able to do is get a cleaner first in, first out serial um, strict sending of responses in the order that they were issued, um, which is effectively what the document recommends is probably the, the ideal way to deliver resources. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, and so, so I mentioned the interop, like I said, we've got some clients sending signals and I'll explain a little bit more about that shortly. Um, and we have some service implementations that always did some kind of scheduling. Uh, Robin Marks and, and co uh, have done some nice surveys using different clients and probing different implementations to see um, what they do, what schemes they do. They've reported some, some of this back to people who are doing maybe last in, first out um, and, and telling them that that's not ideal. And, and these two things are kind of independent. You can, you can fix your scheduler without necessarily having to implement the extendable priority scheme in, in wholesale, um, especially things like reprioritization. Um, you might be able to come up with something a bit more performant and acting similarly with, with some tweaks, which I think is a good thing. Um, so yeah, the question I have is, are they, are they consuming the extendable priorities yet? Um, you know, some interact, interop activity could help and test and measure this stuff. Um, some of us have talked about this here and there. Like, nothing so far has been kind of written down anywhere. I do wonder if defining some test cases to exercise just some basic core functionality would let us show that, okay, you know, the example I just gave was first in, first out. Well, yeah, that's pretty obvious. But what about things where we have uh, weighting of, of resources that were requested later in the connection? Can you prove that those can preempt earlier requests at a lower priority, those kinds of things. Um, and so in part of the uh, some of the side discussions we've been having in the uh, in the kind of HTTP3 realm, uh, Tatsuhiro, uh, while he was implementing this in NG TCP2, came up with a suggestion of a query string syntax, um, which uh, has been quite useful for me personally. Um, but it, it's, not, I, it's not an end goal to, to use this, but you know, we have a, a basic command line client that can take a list of URLs and hit a server with them. Um, and by using this kind of query string, we can very simply come up with a diverse set of different priority urgency levels and incrementals and kind of get good coverage of those things. If we're trying to do this with a header or a frame in an early inter implementation slash interrupt phase, uh, you come up with having to design an API um, or command line tools, those kinds of things which, which complicate um, and prevent some of the, maybe the quick wins people want to do. So something to consider. Uh, I don't think we need to discuss this here, but if anyone is interested in maybe some some discussion on the list about interop um, and whether they think there's merit in any of these questions, um, I, I'd be happy to, to take that conversation ahead uh, offline. Next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, since adoption, uh, we published a draft zero zero, which tried to work through some of the issues that we had. Uh, this is based on some some discussion, uh, mainly on the GitHub issues. And so, the major the major change in draft zero zero um, compared to the non adopted document is that we used to have this the sense of strict semantics that although we had an urgency level with a range from zero to seven the different values had um, like meanings and you know there was a prerequisite which was the most and a default and then supplementary and because there's a lot of text that was describing things and, and some of the feedback is that it was although it the, 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 there's only there's there's not that many levels um, and there's not a lot of granularity there that actually um, some implementers felt restricted by giving assigning meaning to those levels. And so through the course of the discussion, we decided that it, it, actually it would be okay if we just had the same range, um, eight levels of urgency, um, and and to say that a client can kind of use those however it would like, um, with the expectation that the server transmits in an order from uh, low urgency to high urgency. Um, so during the course of that discussion, we should have said, we, we kind of agreed that the default should change from one to three. 
Um, unfortunately, that change didn't make it into draft 00. zero. That was just a clerical error. Uh, so that has since been fixed in the editor's copy and I anticipate that will make it into the next draft. Um, but we still have a special call out to the, the largest urgency level there, seven, which is background. And we just say that, you know, if you're using something that's kind of interactive for browsing a web page, uh, you probably don't want to request things at a background level because it's not going to end up um, performing in a way that you would like. Okay, yeah, next slide. Thanks. Thanks for the prompt. So the, the remaining issue, having got over that one, the remaining large issue that we, we'd like some, some input from the group on is this kind of discussion about headers versus frames. And this comes down to how to signal the initial priority. Uh, there's an issue open for this. Um, might not have the, the title about headers versus frames, but ultimately that seems to be where most of this discussion is now being concentrated. So on one hand, headers are, you know, there's a camp that like headers and, and find it useful. Uh, and there's another camp on the other hand that likes frames and says that, you know, we shouldn't have it. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, what, what does any of this mean? So, so currently, what the text says is that resources have an initial priority that is signaled in headers. Um, the resources can be reprioritized using a priority update frame that is sent on a control stream. Um, and yet, yeah, that supports reprioritization. That frame itself carries a stream ID of the thing to reprioritize. Um, and in H3, that can also be a push ID because um, they share different spaces. Um, and along with the ID, it carries a new priority value, which is just the ASCII encoding of the priority parameters, as I showed earlier. Next slide. So given that we have frames and headers already, and that there's two camps, and neither seems to really want to chop their hand off um, and, and lose the, the pros or advantages that they see from their side, um, you know, given we have a, an ability to send a frame already, um, and that's in the spec, could we possibly just send that before a request rather than have to wait for a request to have been sent with or without a priority header first, um, and then wait to, to update the priority of it? Um, and so in practice, uh, what we've seen is that Chrome is already doing this in spite of the text that, that would say it shouldn't. Um, and in practice, actually, Chrome's behavior had to be accommodated by HTTP3 servers because there's no ordering guarantees between the control stream and the request streams. Um, so, you know, in, in sense, if, if there's some reordering, say, or a server application doesn't read those stream, the application, so if the application doesn't read the data out of the stream in the order that it was necessarily strictly received, um, there's a possibility that that the reprioritization signals received before the thing that it refers to. And there was some guidance already for this to say about buffering and how you would accommodate that thing. Um, I see Ian's got a question. I, I wonder so if that's some clarification. Have, uh, so uh, Lucas, we actually have two people in queue. Um, Martin had a clarification okay. from a little bit ago. So we have Martin and then Ian. All right, uh, I think I'm yeah, supposed sure. to announce myself with Martin Thompson. Uh, is this working? Terrible. Yeah, All right. Um, the, the question that I have is, are we assuming that we need reprioritization? Because I thought that was in contention as well. Uh, that is a, a good clarification point. Thanks, Martin. I did gloss over that. Um, I haven't, um, we can, I haven't got slides that speak to that point because, um, yeah. I, I don't have that. It is a good question. We can discuss that during this meeting. It, it doesn't necessarily help us overcome the headers versus frames issue. It is related. If we decide we don't need road prioritization, that possibly tips things in balance of not right. having frames at all. Yes, which I think is the point you're getting to. Um, Indeed. I think yeah. you, you've already extrapolated from where I'm going there, so I don't think I need to say any more. I'll let him ask a question. Yep. That's thank, thank you.
Uh, this is it, it, is it my my next or? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I was going to kind of put a clarification point that, um, the, to my knowledge, the thing that Chrome is doing today uh, does not violate any normative text in the existing document due to the fact that Lucas, uh, as he pointed out, um, due to HTTP3 having no reordering order and guarantees, any of these things can kind of uh, arrive at any time. So, um, you know, you you sort of have to support the frame possibly arriving before the, the request anyway. Um, and so the choice to do that was partially just it matches the existing semantics of what uh, Chrome was already doing, which it was using a frame. Um, to speak to Martin's comment, the design team uh, came back with the decision that reprioritization was important, both because it was existing, it was being used in existing applications, including web browsers. Um, and also, it seemed like there were use cases when it was compelling. So um, I would personally rather not revisit that decision, but um, I just wanted to kind of give you a reminder of what uh, the design team, I think, had come up with in the past. That's all. Thank you. Um, we do have Martin in the queue again, looks like. I don't know if we want to let Lucas go first uh, before we have that debate. Because I was on the um, design team. I think. Um, let, let's have your response, Martin. I, I don't have anything to add to this right now. So, okay. Um, so I think the response there is fairly simple. It's just because people are doing it doesn't mean that it's actually any good. Um, and we're not seeing any evidence that this is necessary. We're seeing evidence that people are willing to implement it, which is great, but um, necessity is, is different. And there's a lot of complexity involved in having to manage the relationship between two things that aren't synchronized. So I'd like to establish the fact that we need it or that there is some value in it. Other than in theory, because we've had this before, have this debate before, we, we also needed priority trees in theory and looked at what, where that got us. Is there a particular piece of evidence, Martin, that you'd like in terms of saying it's necessary? Yeah, I think this is a little complicated, but um, there's a number of things that would be helpful in this, and I don't think any one of them would be um, uniquely um, definitive on this point. But I would say that there's evidence that this has some material improvement for some class of application, and that servers would be willing to implement it in the in the sense that um, not just Google servers implementing it, but in more in, in general. And, and that it works when random person implements it. Yeah, um, I, I do see the point here. And, and if, I think the comment I can make is that the, the outcome of that decision will in, in, impact this headers versus frames debate, which is why it is important. I don't know if I have the answer. I don't know if um, we can come up with that answer today or if we need further input from the list. What I can say is from my implementation experience that with this simpler scheme, um, it seems more straightforward for us to be able to support parsing a reprioritization signal and enacting that. But um, right now in the work in progress uh, piece that we have, we do not support reprioritization um, simply because we wanted to, to sort out the base aspects of rewriting the scheduler to support the scheme in the first place. Um, and without a, you know, uh, effectively maybe interrupt test that can help validate reprioritization is, is being implemented, you end up in, in possibly a place where the client doesn't know if it's useful to, to do this or not, um, like, kind of a chicken and egg thing. We have Kazuho. So, um, from our experience, we have implemented uh, the priority update frame. Uh, it was a bit of pain to do the, the buffering. Uh, I mean, buffering the priority update frame that 
arrives before the stream, though that's something we've done in HTTP2 priorities because we have the idle stream being prioritized in HTTP2. So it's nothing more complicated than HTTP2. And other aspects of the new prioritization scheme is much more simpler than HTTP2. So I'd say that it's still much more simpler than HTTP2. Okay, so I, I don't know if we're going to be able to answer that question. I think um, maybe maybe if we just continue progressing through the slides, bearing in mind that some of the outcome of of, of the proposal um, is pressing on um, some other discussion that might need to happen, uh, if people are okay with that. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Uh, so. Uh, in the spirit of that discussion and trying to rationalize it, even if the core basis of it might be uh, wrong, um, there is a PR that's open now. Um, this has been solicited to the working group um, and, and had some suggestions and feedback that have tried to be incorporated already. But as a, as a kind of headline summary, what it does is it, it gives more formality that a priority update is allowed for initial priority. It adds some more clarification on which um, endpoint might be able to send this thing and which might not, um, you know, these kinds of things. Uh, the name is a little bit odd if you're going to use it as an initial priority. Uh, I don't think we need to bite shed that on this call, especially if we aren't convinced we need it anyway. So we'll move on from that one. But, um, you know, what it says is clients can send a priority update. They you now have two ways of sending an initial priority. Um, so you, we say, that they may omit a header field and send only a priority update frame. Uh, they can send the priority update frame first and then a field. Um, this isn't really much different to uh, a reprioritization event. And we already have some text that describes, like Kazuho just mentioned, that the buffering and, and which, which of those signals you probably want to give. Um, uh, the, the last bullet point on this slide, ultimately the priority update frame would trump a header because there's no way to distinguish it from a reprioritization. Um, uh, servers don't send a priority update frame in this case. Uh, they they possibly could, but I took the, the kind of editorial decision to not allow that just for complexity's sake. Um, I'll, I'll take a question that there seems to be one. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, how do you account for the resource allocation here? Obviously, you can't get one of these things for, that refers to something that the other side couldn't create. But there's some layering issues there in terms of knowing that a particular stream is allowed or not, or looking at the push IDs and what's allowed there. Have you considered yeah, that sure. in PR? Um, that was my intention too. There, there, there may well be gaps, but you know, compared to the current text in draft 00, zero there is a few you know, to-dos, uh, state uh, what to do, if you got a, a reprioritization priority update frame for a push ID that was beyond the max push ID limit, um, you know that some of that is is directly visible to the application, like you've just said. Uh, other things like if you got a priority update for a request stream beyond the max streams uh, or, or max bidirectional stream limit that had been advertised. Uh, are also addressed as far as I'm aware. Um, if there's errors in that, like I'd like to get that tidied up. But I, I, I'm not, I, I don't know, based on my ex implementation experience, there isn't a layering violation here because the application is in control of, of the stream limits that it effectively asks the library to, to manage on its behalf. And we have a way to, to query things, I believe. Uh, is that I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I was concerned here about the the case where you have um, effectively a string budget that you've told the transport that you've got. And so you don't necessarily know where the transport is with that. And you're expected to deal with one of these frames and, and know that it identifies a stream 
that you've allowed the other side to have. And that requires crossing the boundary into the transport to know whether the transport has permitted that particular stream ID when when that frame comes in. That's all. No, that, that, that's, it's a keen observation. I think um, you know the priority update frame was based on the old HTTP three priority frame, and so uh, you know the, the even the language of the prioritized element ID uh, referred to a, a stream ID for requests. So. Right. I, uh, but I would say that the layering violation was always there. I didn't implement the old priority scheme, so I can't say how hard it was. I know, uh, well, I believe some people on, on the call did implement the old priority scheme. Um, maybe they can speak to that. You might say that by removing priority, we uh, fixed the glitch. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, this is Tommy Polly, just inserting myself as a individual um i'd echo what martin was saying that we shouldn't assume that the relationship between the application and the transport is so directly managed as far as what the max stream id currently is um in our implementation you know while we may allow an application to be aware of that there can definitely be modes in which it's more just like here's a window threshold of what I'm roughly able to have and the transport maybe managing this and moving this without direct interaction from the application. Um, okay, um, I, I do wonder if some of that is maybe um, some feedback to give to the HTTP3 document in some way um, beyond just priorities, but I'll, I will take that feedback on board. Okay, next slide, please. I'm aware of time, so um, I'll try and pick up my pace a little bit. Uh, the desired outcome from this meeting that I had was to say, uh, you know, we we put this proposal out there on the April the thirtieth. We've had some some general feedback that's been supportive. I mean, I'm hearing maybe slightly different things in this meeting, which is okay. Um, it felt like when I wrote these slides that you know, if we could carry on incorporating some improvements, we'd be ready to merge in readiness for a draft zero one at some point. Um, uh, some remaining things to highlight and discuss that I would have liked to get through in this meeting is that there's been some frame format changes to HP3 and how we do some versioning across the priorities draft. Um, and also a question to the working group about diagramming of HP2 and HP3 frames when they appear in the same document. So. Um, if those two discussion points are, are what's going to come up next. So if you go on to the next slide, please. The, um, there was a separate issue um, to, to the one around headers versus frames, um, which was to consider using two HB3 frame types rather than a bit field. Um, so in the bottom here, we see the, the old layout of the frame that dedicated um, eight bits uh, of which only one was used to distinguish between prioritizing a request or a push ID. As mentioned earlier, this this emulates the old priority frame um, in that how it, it would perform this disambiguation. That's although it's it's a waste of, of a byte, which isn't necessarily that much overhead. Other work um, that's happened uh, in stuff like the datagram frame has given a, a precedent for using frame types to distinguish between um, you know, frames that semantically say do the, a similar thing, but require slightly different uh, formal layouts when they're serialized to the wire. Uh, so this is what the old frame looked like, type 0F and a T bit. Next slide, please. Uh, the new frame, um, the proposal is to remove that bit field, keep the ID and the value fields within it, um, but then change the frame type. So the first frame type here, which I won't read out, uh, applies to requests. And the second frame type applies to pushes. I'll explain why those frame types are as they are um, in a moment. Uh, but since draft 00, zero uh, the quick documents have landed changes to um, modify the, the language of their diagrams. So with this change, that adopts a similar uh, lingua here. So rather than ASCII diagrams, we've got more of a textual notation that includes the full frame 
layout, not just the frame payload, but it includes um, a definition of the type, uh, the, the allowed ranges, which are the two values shown above, the length of that frame, and then the two pertinent fields, the prioritized element ID and the priority field value. Next slide, please. Um, so, so the question some of you might be asking is why change the frame type from um, you know, 0xf to that horrible thing? Um, and so the justification for this, in my mind, is that this is a breaking change in the frame format. Um, with the priorities draft, we don't have any way to signal what version of the priorities draft we're using at any point in time. And therefore, there's a risk that the endpoints generate and parse the frame with different expectations. If you have, you know, uh, without that bit field in there, you're going to start parsing things differently. And there's a danger here that I see of, of a parsing error causing of the frame, which can cause a, a must of a connection error. Uh, that given that these frames are anticipated to be sent, um, that could end up with some bad stuff. Uh, and we might be able to get over this in some early interop and fix things, but longer term, I, I was trying to, to mitigate things. So some of the options we thought of protecting against such an error would be to tie this change to a HTTP3 draft version. Um, so you know we might say priorities draft 01 when it gets published, um, is is only going to be working with draft 28 um, of the hb3 document the downside to that approach that i see is that we may need to integrate the priorities draft faster um, than we can iterate hb3 especially now that it's late in in its process um, and if we need to make any further breaking changes um, or changes that affect stuff in some weird way uh, that uh, we end up painting ourselves in a corner uh, straight away. Um, so a different option, which is the proposal um, or, or the text in this proposal, is to pick different types um, for each priorities draft um, so that it's very clear uh, when you see that type on the wire that you, you understand what priorities draft um, is being communicated. Um, and, and then once we're ready to actually finalize this document, uh, we can revert back to the 0xf and 0x1 types um, because they're nicer. Uh, and, and I'll credit Kazuo with, with coming up with um, that proposal as well. So I just codified it into the text. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any opinions on, on which of those that they'd like to mention here or to take it to the issue or the list. Uh, I see a comment in the Java about an extension that indicates the priorities version. I think, to me at least, that fundamentally comes back to, uh, you know, needing to wait for settings before you can send stuff, um, and this kind of whole problem with avoiding delaying of requests. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. Uh, a comment that we might want to use a transport parameter which is a broader scoped issue i think of uh, codifying hb3 or application layer specifics into the quick transport um, which i think is uh, a long-term issue and i don't think we're going to resolve that in time but that's just my personal opinion we have uh, ian in the line yep uh, I was going to say that I think option two is probably um, the, the right option, and which is what you wrote, wrote up. Um, and I think you, it, it's also, I believe, <clears throat> what the um, pack frequency draft that John and I are working on and Kazuo, I think, suggested the same approach for that. Um, so, you know, uh, it's hopefully we'll get a few tries at, at, at this approach and, and see how it works. But I, I think it's certainly workable and um, pretty straightforward. So. Thank you. I don't see a big outside either. Um, Martin? I see an upside <laughs> in that I think implementations will be far more tolerant of just random junk that we send them if we send them junk with a purpose, uh, even if they don't understand it. So I think this is a 
good general strategy for for working on experiments. I think that the odds of collision here are astronomically low, so carry on. Uh, as for the uh, diagramming issue that you covered before, um, that's an editorial problem. I, I trust that the people editing this draft will resolve that by themselves. Um, I've got a slide for that, so so let's move on to it. Just just so I can give some more context, and and ultimately, if there's nothing, um, you know, then great. But um, yeah, for HP two frame in this draft, there is there is no functional change. All that's happened is for consistency. I've updated the diagram. Um, and so what we have is the full H2 frame layout, the length of it, the type. Um, you'll notice this type is 0xf. Uh, this is partly because uh, basically the, the type is only 8 bits. So we don't have as much space. And I'm concerned about wasting um, a precious space for experiments. I also don't necessarily see there being as much experimental work happening in the H2 frame department. Um, but again, if people disagree, I'm, I'm happy to consider that. This is just some kind of editorial decisions um, with Strawman proposal put out there for some feedback. Uh, but you can see that but this is you know, the full frame definition. And the only things that really care about for the priority update frame is the fields after R, so the prioritized stream ID and the priority field value. Um, so there's already been some discussion in the community uh, about on on the ticket about this. Um, if, next slide, please. Um, that you know some people might be familiar with just seeing frame payloads, um, especially with the H2 draft where there's like a lot more fields that appear before a frame payload. Um, there's a possibility of a flags. Um, space and then each frame type would define if it has flags or not. Um, uh, and, and H2 continues to use those ASCII diagrams, uh, but H3 dropped that in favor of the quick style formatting. Um, and, and so therefore, there might just be some element of surprise for people who are coming at this trying to implement one, you know, one version of the extensible priorities. Uh, and as Martin says, th this is an editorial thing, but the, you know, having some discussion between Kazuo and myself, and, and some input from Mike. Um, yeah, we we wondered if this is more of a, a question for the HTTP working group community as a whole, rather than specific to this issue. There's some options there. I don't think we need to spend time on this um, necessarily in the meeting, but uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone's got a brief opinion or or anything. That this is probably best taken to the list. Okay. Yeah. It has, it has the risk of, of being white shed shape. Okay. Great. So next slide. Uh, so yeah, the the overall shape of the draft is you know we we've closed out one of the same major issues. Uh, we've got this headers versus frames, which is maybe. Dependent on if we think prioritize, reprioritization is needed, and uh, I'll probably need to go away and, and try and answer that question at the same time. But if we if we park those things momentarily and look at the other issues that are open on the draft, um, most of them are just kind of minor clarifications um, and improvements, which are great. I think the only one that is kind of substantial is around server push and what the default priority of a of a push is. Um, I put this as if time permits. I, I think we're probably out of time. So, uh, yeah, there is an issue for this. And if people want to put some commentary on there or on the mailing list, I think there's some discussion to be had. Um, it's, ultimately, I think it's does anyone care about civic push and prioritization? There's some really good discussion between uh, Tom Bergen and Mike Bishop about the different merits of. Of how to default prioritize something and whether you know it, it matters if you can reprioritize this over push quickly, then you get into issues around round trip times and all sorts of stuff. So I think there's some good background reading if people want to, to catch up on that. Um, and that's effectively the end of the slides. So if there's any further questions, otherwise I'll avoid tying up the agenda any further.
Sounds like we're done with that one then. Um, so thank you very much, Lucas. That was great. I'm going to attempt to open the next set of slides. See how that goes. Okay. Can people see the client start header slides? Yep. Fantastic. Oh, lovely. So Brian, are you with us? I see you there. Brian, you're not muted in WebEx, but we can't hear you. You need a physical mute of some sort. Right. It seems like Brian's having some local problems there. Unless he comes on in just the next few seconds, I think we'll switch the order of the presentations to let him try and sort that out. Um, Brian, if you're there, could you perhaps use the WebEx chat so that we can see that? Ah. I think he's disappeared and come. He's going to. Okay. Let's let him try and come back and see if that works. All right, do you want to just yeah. switch over? Yeah, let's do that. Go ahead and switch to one of our presentations then. Brian's back. Oh. Brian, can you try speaking again? Wait, you're muted, Brian, one second. Right now. How about now? Ah. Lovely. I'm sorry, I had to drop off and rejoin, but here I am. Um, <laughs> apologies. Okay, uh, the client cert HTTP header draft. This is an individual draft um, discussing conveying client certificate information um, from mutually authenticated TLS connections from TLS terminating your first proxies back to origin server applications. Uh, there's been a little bit of discussion on the list um, and here to talk about kind of where it's at and uh, where this working group may or may not want to go with it. So uh, thanks for your time. And um, Mark, if you could give me the next slide, please. So just a little bit of uh, context and motivation behind this. Um, basically, the, there's a world out there where um, uh, very often HTTPS application deployments oftentimes are deployed in such a way that the TLS term connection from the client is uh, terminated by a reverse proxy sitting somewhere in front of the actual HTTPS application backend. Um, it doesn't mean that necessarily that there's not HTTPS between the backend components, but that initial connection that the client sees to the server um, is, is terminated by this, this front end component. You see this in all kinds of things like old fashioned into your reverse proxy and or origin server deployments. Uh, more and more now is CDN as a service type offerings or, or other application load balancing type services. And uh, even ingress controllers sometimes do this with um, microservice type architectures. And in the world out there, TLS client certificate authentication is sometimes used. It's not super prevalent, but it is used occasionally. And in these cases, the actual backend application often needs or wants to know something about the client certificate that was designed. Um, but in the absence of some standardized method of conveying the client certificate information from the component that terminates the, uh, the TLS connection to the back end, different implementations have done this differently, or in some cases, not at all, um, making these types of deployments not possible with certain components. 
I uh, just wanted to give some context that I'm, I'm here in this working group sort of by a way of a conversation that started off in the OAuth working group around related draft um, using mutual TLS authentication and people sort of bemoaning the difficulties of getting it to work with different components and different types of um, software. And that in turn sort of led to uh, a draft that was ultimately moved into SEC dispatch to be discussed. And SEC Dispatch more or less dispatched the work here. So uh, it's not, uh, it's HTTP related, but maybe not in the normal wheelhouse of what this working group might deal with, but that's uh, some sort of retroactive explanation of how this draft landed here, or at least this presentation landed here. Um, next slide, please, Mark. So the draft currently is a, a simplistic proposal that uh, ideally could potentially enable turnkey type interoperable integration between independently developed and deployed components. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Basically, the client um, would make a normal mutually authenticated TLS connection and HTTP request is sent over that. The reverse proxy component verifies the certificate on presentation and then it sanitizes um, this HTTP header on each request. And once that's done, it passes the lease certificate information, the lease client certificate, as a new header with defined name and encoding to the origin server on the back end. And the origin server then can do what it needs to do uh, with, with information and contact from this client certificate itself. Um, typically, well, I, I guess there's not a typical, but the idea is that by passing the client certificate, you're relying on the reverse proxy to do certificate validation and authentication, but providing information, contextual information about the client through including the whole certificate so that the origin server can do what it needs to do with it, whether that's customizing content based on the, the content of the certificate or making um, more granular application level uh, authorization policy decisions or, or whatever it might be. But um, the, the sort of basic idea here is that we take that client certificate, I feel like I'm repeating myself, I'm sorry, and pass it as an encoded header to the backend application in a standardized way, which would you know, allow for more ease of interop um, through you know, reverse proxy and origin servers that are, are independently developed. So um, with that, uh, next slide, please, Mark. So, some things to consider, I guess, where this is being brought to the working group here is uh, the question of whether there's interest in working group adoption of this document. Um, I know a number of individuals and on behalf of themselves and sometimes on behalf of their employers have expressed interest in the, the concept as a whole. Um, and this working group seems like it's likely the best forum to uh, proceed with work on a document like this if, if there's sufficient interest. But there's been a number of, um, I guess, more substantial issues raised just on the individual draft. And I don't know if these necessarily are prerequisites to considering or working forward to adoption, or if we should consider adoption um, and then sort of dive into the particular issues. But I list them here alongside it just for uh, the sake of conversation. And the main issue I think that's, that's come up is getting to an appropriate mechanism to preventing header injection. The current draft requires that the reverse proxy always sanitize the headers. And by that, I mean it would overwrite or um, remove the client serve header from all inbound connections. And this presumes that there's not some other way through that, first of all, that the reverse proxy actually does that effectively and that there's not also some other way to um, send requests directly to the back end such that a client could spoof the client cert header and send something under its own control directly to the back end and sort of fool it into believing that um, client cert authentication did happen at the front end. Um, currently, the, as I said, the draft is working off of sanitization. There's been a number of folks that have um, expressed concern that that's either an insufficient security mechanism or one that's easy to get wrong, as well as something that sort of fails unsafe. It's, uh, it's not clear when, th there's no obvious failure mode when it's not being done correctly. So 
the assumption it looks like it's working fine, but um, the vulner a vulnerability may exist um, un sort of less easily uh, identified. Um, there's a lot of different ways that this could be approached. Um, so I guess there's this sort of a question, a larger question of whether this is sufficient or we need to do something more. And if something more is desired, there's a, an entire, uh, a whole litany of different ways it could be approached. So I won't go into that necessarily now, but amongst that two would have been in the scope of that applicability. So this idea of um, sort of passing meta information from a, a reverse proxy to a backend is, is not unique to this draft. So this, the idea of sanitization or production, these kind of headers or ensuring their integrity is not unique to this draft. Um, I'd be a bit loath to define a sort of one-off solution beyond sanitization in the scope of this draft alone, but the doing something larger is certainly beyond the scope of this draft. So there's a, a, a bit of question about how, how to address that um, if in fact something more was to be desired there. Um, that's probably the biggest open issue, uh, I guess, right now being discussed. There are some uh, other questions regarding sort of the sufficiency of just passing the whole end entity certificate. That's what the draft currently does is take the past the client in any certificate in its entirety because there's different use cases, different needs for the content, various bits of content from the, from the cert, be it the subject DN, various SAN entries. Sometimes um, folks want to use the entire certificate itself or various other parts of it. So just passing the whole thing seemed to um, be a, a nice way to accommodate everything, but it's potentially large in some cases. On the other end of that, there's been um, some desire expressed to have the entire chain pass, which um, is, is also uh, feels like it might be uh, too much, might potentially run into size limitation issues with, with the headers themselves. But um, I, I guess I just noted here that there are some open questions about whether uh, that is either sufficient or excessive. And then there's been some questions about the appropriateness of error handling across the various layers, as well as some other sort of minor layering issues as we're dealing with trying to convey the, the transport layer authentication of the mutually authenticated TLS connection up front through the, the HTTP request on the back end. There's some, some impedance mismatches that potentially uh, rise up around the edges that are, are potentially problematic. Um, or at least might need to be considered uh, and documented better. Um, so let's uh, try to sort of cover the, the known sort of open issues right now. Um, and with that, I guess uh, jump to the next slide, which. So Brian, um, we're almost out of time for this slot. Um, so thanks for that. Actually, I think. There's nothing new on here, so yeah. Um, so, uh, just to set expectations, you know, we're not going to take any hums or anything to call. I, I think we got instructions from the ISG that that's not productive. Um, but what I would like to do is, is to find if there are any questions that people have that the answers to those questions would change or, or influence their, their decision about whether they want to support this or not support it uh, being adopted by the working group. Because what we'll do is a call for adoption in, on the mailing list. There's already been a substantial amount of discussion on the mailing list. Um, so, does anybody have any questions to inform that discussion that, that Brian could answer right now, or should we just take it to the list? Okay, Eckert? Yeah, so, I mean, I think there's been a bunch of back and forth about how um, uh, fancy this mechanism should be. Um, I certainly don't want to discuss that now, but I think it'd be useful to understand whether um, there, how much appetite there is for the people who want this mechanism for more fanciness? Because the answer is no, but then there are people who think it should be more fancy, then probably the answer is, why don't you get a code point some other way? And if the answer is yes, then we should probably think about adopting it. But having like a, a, a situation where we define something super fancy that nobody actually wants, but on the other hand, we can't define something not fancy because people think it's not good enough, that's not really that helpful. Martin is no longer in queue. Um, I, 
I think I sort of agree with Becker there. It, yeah, there's, it's a, there's a question in my mind of how much appetite there is for doing something more and, and whether or not that that needs that it's necessary to move this forward. I, it's it's yeah, it's the largest question I have. I don't want to over engineer something that will then become unuseful, but I'm I am sensitive to desires of having something more there. Um, but would want to try to get to a, a, a broader understanding of what the consensus or rough consensus really is to move forward. It sounds like we need to talk about it a little bit more on the list and then perhaps think about a call for adoption and see how that goes. Does that make sense? Um, I, I think so. I've, I've been struggling with, and I still tried to say earlier on in this, it's, it's a little bit unclear to me which, you know, which needs to come first. Um, it, the discussion has been ongoing a lot and I, I certainly can have some more of it, but it's, Sometimes it feels a little fruitless to to continue sort of thrashing on the same issue on an individual draft. Um, I don't know if it. Sorry, I, I don't know how else to say that. Like, it, happy to do it, but I don't know if that needs to proceed adoption or not. I, I'm not sure how to proceed exactly. Uh, I think Tom and I should talk, but I I personally think that we're probably almost ready for a call for adoption. Okay. Let, 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 let us talk about it and maybe talk to Barry and we'll, we'll see where we go. I, I, I'm not hearing any, any strong objection to adopting it. It's just a question of exactly where it's going to go, which is, of course, always the question is when we really put it on something. So, of course. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for that, Brian. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have user defined resources. Can folks see the slides? I can. That's good enough. Well, go ahead. Thanks. I can. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thanks for inviting me, Mark. Um, so um, if we go to the next slide, I can uh, try and go through this quickly. The, uh, the main reason that uh, I submitted the draft um, a couple of months back, um, this was an informational draft. I didn't really feel like there would be a kind of a, a broad use case or a broad need for adoption for it, but I wanted to kind of write something down uh, because I felt probably other people would f face uh, similar issues and, and might want to tackle it in a, in a, in a standardized way rather than um, you know ending up down the road with lots of different uh, approaches to this type of problem. So the problem is that uh, the, the, the product I develop is a, is a hosted, I guess you can think of it as a platform as a service, um, and it allows people who are skilled in, in databases to create REST APIs using SQL and PL SQL. And um, that means that we have two major classes of errors in the, in that system. We have errors that arise due to functional issues in the product itself, in the engine, uh, in the hosting platform. Um, and hopefully those are rare. And if they occur, that we can respond to them quickly and uh, deal with them and triage them and get them fixed. On the other hand, customers are going to be writing the SQL and PS SQL themselves. They're going to be doing that iteratively. They're going to make mistakes. Um, those you know, they are going to produce all kinds of different error conditions in the database. And we need to be able to clearly classify those error conditions as arising from the fact that the uh, order of this user-defined resource, this REST API, uh, made a mistake in, 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 in their script. Um, and um, what we're finding is that uh, in production, we are all too often um, getting issues uh, pumped up to development, having come through support that, um, that turn out to be uh, just purely issues arising from an error in the user's script. So if we go to the next slide. Um, 
So why is that happening? Why, why are people saying, oh, I think there's something wrong with your platform rather than I think there's something wrong with my script? And uh, the reason is that uh, at the moment, uh, we would report that issue as a 500 internal server error because that's what it is. The script that was being executed uh, for that REST API um, failed to complete and the server wasn't able to do anything with it except to report that, you know, it was a server error. And, um, you know, the fact is that people know certain status codes very well for 404, 500, 501, 200, okay, things like that. And so, you know, there's kind of this implicit knowledge that people build up and they see 500 internal server means that the, the system that they're using is broken. Um, they don't really, you know, do too much thinking about, well, why is that? Is that due to myself or is that due to the, the person that's operating the platform um, sometimes? And so um, they'll file a support ticket and support people dealing with lots of different products. They don't necessarily know the ins and outs of any particular product. They look at it, they see a 500 internal server error. They say, well, that, in my experience, also means that there's something wrong with the platform. Let me uh, escalate that to development. Seems like something they should look at. And uh, you can see how you know everybody ends up wasting time uh, and money um, trying to resolve the issue. Um, so that's why we're kind of thinking that something that sends a stronger signal to the developer of the resource that maybe there's something wrong with their script that they need to take another look at it might save everybody uh, a bit of time. Um, so next slide. So before I talk about how we can do, uh, you know, what we see as the solution, um, I want to talk about things that we've tried and we've found to have very limited uh, effectiveness. Um, so uh, first of all, what we did was we changed the the, the, the reason phrase on the, the HTTP uh, status to say user defined resource error with a 500 status. Um, and, and that did help to some degree. Uh, we also uh, put a message in the response body saying, you know, this request failed because there was an error evaluating the script, you know, uh, something to try and uh, you know, clue the, the developer in that there's something wrong with their script. Um, we put an, a header on the response, uh, an error reason header that has, uh, you know, the encoded error message, um, the root error message from the database. Uh, we have to escape it because, you know, um, it uh, might have its own uh, conflicting characters in it that conflict with the header syntax. Um, so the problems with that, um, in access logs, in automated monitoring tools, they're generally just looking at the status code. They're not really looking at the reason phrase. It's not shown in the access log and uptime monitoring tools and things like that. They'll just be looking at the status code. They don't care what the, uh, the reason phrase is. So that signal that we're trying to communicate gets lost. Um, uh, you have things like, you know, this could be in a multi-tiered application and there's a custom error page in front of this 500 status. So they changed the status code, sorry, they changed the error page to show, you know, just a, a generic text about something went wrong with the server. And uh, so our, our phrase is completely lost. And the error reason header is proprietary to us. Nobody knows about it. And so, you know, without special knowledge, clients just ignore it. So um, we're like, okay, could we try and standardize error reason? And we're like, well, you know, there's already the HTTP problems syntax, uh, RFC, and maybe we could try and extend something there, but it, we still feel that, you know, losing that strong signal in the access log and in the monitoring tools um, is going to limit its effectiveness. So uh, next slide. So our proposal is to add a new 500 range um, uh, status code. Um, so the uh, if this were to be adopted, um, that 
um, you know, a, a new uh, status code would be assigned. Um, and, and we'd see two benefits to that. It would be that signal wouldn't get lost all the way through the stacks. So that that status code would be propagated from, from our service all the way to the clients. Um, you know, I would expect that monitoring tools and, uh, and that could evolve to understand the significance of that status code and, and, and maybe give the, the, the person who set up that monitoring service more, uh, more useful direction in terms of how they need to deal with the error. Uh, and similarly, end users can just Google that status code and they'll um, you know, find out pretty quickly that it means that there's probably something wrong in their script and that they can uh, you know, look at that as the first cause rather than assuming that the platform has a problem and that they need to contact their support. And so hopefully all of that would lead to saving time and money. Um, but that's, that's, the, uh, that's the proposal. Um, so I submitted a draft, uh, an informational draft that's linked on the agenda. Um, I guess what I would like to see um, is um, if there's any broader interest in, in, in this type of approach, if there's anybody else that would be interested in uh, taking this forward, and um, or if people have suggestions and alternative approaches to dealing with this problem, so I'd also like to hear that. Great, okay, thanks, Tom. So uh, if folks have any uh, input, uh, any feedback? We have just a few minutes left. Yeah, my question is, where do you draw the line here? Um, knowing that this is, you know, that the server is operated by multiple entities, it's not something that clients typically care about when it comes to getting an error. Um, this sort of says, well, 500 is reserved for the operator of the server versus the thing that runs in the server, but that's all internals of the server. And it seems like case is to sort of externalize some of those um, internal structurings of the server so that the client sees that. And I don't see a whole lot of value to a client in having this signal at all. In fact, I, I think it probably confuses things quite a bit. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I mean, I, you know, that's why I kind of have reservations about uh, how broadly this would be used. I think it's, you know, thinking about this myself, the only other way that I can see that uh, you can avoid having to do this. So it's, it's partly because there's kind of a new model starting to evolve where the operator of a service isn't necessarily the person who writes the services. You know, traditionally till now, you know, in one shape or form, the person who writes the APIs or the, you know whatever the resources are in your web service is the person that's operating the the server as well to a large degree. And now we're starting to move into a world where you know we're starting to have things like these edge computing uh, facilities and, and platforms as a service, where there's a uh, you know there's a, a fairly clear line that's obvious on the server side between um, you know the operator of the service and the order of these user-defined resources. It makes absolutely no difference to the client, right? They shouldn't care. Right. And the spec says that if you don't know what a 500 status code is, you should treat it as 500 exactly, not something else that, you know, the spec says 500. So I would, I would say that that's clients should treat this code and any other code as, you know, and the 500 code as, as exactly the same. Um, so, so the question here that I think might help illuminate my point a little bit more clearly is that say you have someone who's, who's operating in a cloud service, um, so there's an infrastructure provider and they're running something in a VM somewhere or in, in some sort of container um, on that cloud service, and they have con contracted with a CDN, there are now two infrastructure providers involved. Does the CDN get to use this new error code if the origin server messes up? And does the origin server get to make this call if the next stage messes up? And can you see how this might have turtles all the way down? Yeah, 
Sure. Yeah. So just a time check. We have a couple of people in queue. I want to make sure we get to them, but we're technically out of time. So, um, Julian, can you go quickly? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, so, I think um, if I understand correctly, this, for instance, would happen if the user defined resource would be defined with. In, uh, invalid SQL statements. So, um, did you consider whether it would be possible to detect the brokenness of the user res defined resource at the time of when the user defined resource is defined? I mean, these are modified using HTTP as well, right? So, is it potentially possible to actually reject creation of these user-defined resources if they are broken in some way. So, uh, so the end users would never actually see them. Yeah, um, not in every case. And to answer the other question, HTTP wouldn't be the only channel through which these could be defined. You could also you know, do them directly in the database and connect to that database through any number of mechanisms. Quickly, um, I agree with Martin that you know we, we have very similar problems with intermediaries where it's it's not clear who generates the the message, and and that brings up another issue for me, which is that you could say this not only about a 500 error, but also you know maybe the 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 infrastructure generated a redirect, or maybe the user code did, or any other status code. And so you'll have this multiplication of status codes if you follow this to its conclusion. And, and that's what concerns me. It seems orthogonal to the core semantics of, of what a status code is. And so to me, I, I think it would be much more successful if we defined a header uh, to, to convey this information. I think it could be complementary to the problem detail stuff. And uh, um, make that a, a standard so that hopefully people will start locking it and people will understand what it is. That would, that would be my preferred. And what about, you know, the fact that, you know, that uh, typically headers don't get, um, you know, caught in access logs and intermediates, like, to the same degree as a status code thing. I know they can be, but. Uh, so that's the wonderful thing about standards is when you get a lot of people doing things the same way, they tend to catch on. Okay. Okay. Uh, Ari, do you want to close us up? Uh, yep, I'll go real quick. I have two. Uh, the first is that I do think there is some prior art, like noting Martin and, um, and Mark's objections. There is prior art in the HTTP 500 range with 502. Uh, you, in this multi CDN case, you can absolutely have multiple gateways, any of which could be generating you a 502 uh, and likely cascade a 502. I think the same problem applies. Uh, but more broadly, I, I agree with Mark's more general assessment, which is this doesn't necessarily strike me as a problem that is best solved in HTTP status code space. This strikes me as a, a problem for the infrastructure provider to solve through their own uh, monitoring infrastructure. So the question is, why should the entire web bear the cost for any one infrastructure provider to uh, communicate to their users? Um, this is a problem that exists in a lot of other places, AWS as well, for example, and by and large, the solution is, uh, seems to be to provide appropriate monitoring and logging such that users are capable of determining the difference between an infrastructure uh, 500 and one that they generated themselves. Thank you. Um, so to try and sum up our hearing, it's strong preference if you were to go down this route to use a header um, is there is there any kind of consensus that people would like to have such a header or still the overall feeling would be actually, you know, it, it, there's probably other ways to address this issue and we don't even need the header in the first place. Where we're at time, but, but just personally, I think it'd be interesting to talk about certain things. I can imagine that would be useful in some cases. Sounds like we can follow up on the list. Thank you. So 
that's it for our meeting, and it is now far past midnight for me at least, uh, and for Martin, I suppose. So we'll speak to everyone hopefully again in about a week or a week minus one hour and 15 minutes. Thanks for and uh, we'll talk to you then. See you then.